Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. You're listening to Item 13, an African food podcast, and I'm your host, Yom Tego. Every other week, we'll delve into the world of African food, including chefs, curators, and bloggers. Here's the show. Today on the show, we welcome back, well, I guess for those who listen to the episode, I think some people ended up listening to that episode. Where really? The sound, the sound wasn't right. Yeah, there were a few downloads of that. But for those who are listening to Yasmin's story for the first time, I guess welcome, uh, welcome. So we tried to record this, was it last year or maybe earlier this year? I believe it was in um, February. Yeah, wow. Or, oh, or January. Yeah, it, it was fun. definitely at the beginning wow. of the year. That's yeah. A long time ago. Yeah. So we've I know, it feels to, like forever. We've been trying to, well, the first time didn't work out. And so we've been trying to reconnect to record and we both seem to be very busy people. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm glad we're able to get this done now. Um, we'll start by telling the audience about who you are. So share who you are, who's Yasmin, what's your um, background? Okay. Uh, well, thank you for having me again. <laughs> I'm really <laughs> glad to to be able to do this again. As I said, I, I really love the show. So, yes, me loves to eat, point blank, period. <laughs> um, and, and I always say it as a joke, even if you can see me. You can see it when you're looking at me because I'm skinny, but I love, <laughs> love to eat. <laughs> I really do. And basically, I, um, I was born and raised in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, from parents um, from Guinea, Senegal, and Mali. So I like to call myself as a West African. Yeah. And um, I, I like to believe that that played a lot into my love for West African food and my love, my, my passion for willing, um, my willingness, sorry, to be, um, to promote that, that, you know, African food. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. You know, born and raised in Cote d'Ivoire. And you grew up, um, you went to school there, did um, live there all your life pretty much? Yeah, I, I, I um, grew up here. I was, I, you know, I stayed here until I was 17. Okay. And then I went to, I'd spent a couple months in Senegal because we, um, we did have political tension okay. in the country in my last year of high school. So I went to finish high school in Senegal. Um, and I went to the U.S. at 17 up until I was 20, 24, 25. Oh, so yeah, I did. I, I, yeah, I went there for college mainly. Um, worked a little bit, but mainly for college. Came back to Cote d'Ivoire, worked for about 10 years. Left again to go <laughs> for a master degree in, um, sorry, in the U.K. Okay. And I came back um, end of last year. And in between, of course, traveling and right. eating my way around the world. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious, like, um, when you first moved, I don't know if you remember when you first moved to Senegal, mm -hmm. um, what your experience with food was like and how, you know, how much did you think it was different or the same? Were you surprised by the food, especially that you tried? Even the culture, I would say. Um, I, not really, mm. because, um, like I said, you know, I've had this 
mix of cultures growing right. up. Yeah. So even though you know we you, you grew up, I grew up here, but you know from my families, from my environment, and even extended family. I mean, you know, yeah. Africans we always yeah. have uncles yeah. and yeah, and aunties from all over. So I did experience some of the Senegalese culture here. Of course, it's not the same thing when you go over right. there, when you're but. Being in the country, um, yeah. Exactly, but the 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 I was always I was already acquainted with the food, the the way um, you know sometimes on Sundays we'll eat um, all together sitting on yeah. the mat, you know eating the different. So it wasn't such a, a, difference, a difference for me, for you, yeah. but definitely being in the country just um, he added to my experience over, I mean, generally speaking. So yeah, I really, really enjoyed it. I'm yeah. now actually looking forward to go back. <laughs> yeah. It was it's great. On my list. I've never been to, I've never been to Senegal. Okay. So I lived, you would not believe this. I lived in the Gambia for a year and I never, okay, you have no excuse. <laughs> I <know. laughs> and I never you have no excuse. Senegal. I just, um, for, for this, I don't know. Gambia is literally in the middle of Senegal. Like it's, wrapped around by Senegal mm-hmm. so, and I heard it's a beautiful country yeah, I mean I they're doing good things yeah. tourism wise and stuff yeah it was it was a good year it was my year after high school like the, I had a year of mm. going to college and spent it there with my family mm. um yeah oh, I'm that's pretty cool Senegal, so it's still on my bucket list of um, <laughs> of West African culture, countries yeah. <laughs> yep yeah. okay and so, like, when we're going to talk about your experiences as a West African food blogger, and I want to start with talking about, like, your inf- your food influences, right? So you have this mixed mash of, you know, Senegal and Mali and, and Cote d'Ivoire. Um, mm-hmm. What were sort of your earliest memories of food? And what made you start in terms of that and translating it to the food blog? How did you go from, you know, enjoying your own food and culture to deciding you wanted to write about or showcase West African food through a blog? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, funny enough, um, well, the, your, your question is as many areas <laughs> to it. So let me, let me start. F- funny enough, my growing up and my experience with the culture the different food and the heritage that you know I've shared from my you know my parents and stuff mm-hmm. didn't really influence my you know me venturing into blogging Interesting. Um, yeah yeah it was only when I went to the US like I said at 17 yeah and I was living um, in Harrisburg um, capital of PA and um, in this residence called International House Okay. So it was basically a lot of international students just living together, um, you know, under, under one roof. And my roommate was Japanese. And it was like, oh, my God, that was, if you want, the the start of it all. Because yeah. being like just meeting other people. I mean, the U.S. is the greatest place ever to meet so many cultures right. at the same yeah. time. Um, you know, I had like a friend from Uzbekistan. I didn't even know where the country was at that time. <laughs> uh, best friend was Vietnamese. And, and all of those people, they love to cook. Right. I love to eat, but I'm not so much of a cook person. <laughs> so I will always be doing dishes and they will cook. So my roommate loved cooking and she was yeah. making all those Japanese dishes. Right. Of course, she introduced me to the world of, you know, um, seafood and I mean, not she seafood, sorry, that. sushi. Yeah. yeah. So that was the beginning of it all because I was like, wow, you know, I mean, I've always been curious about, you know, um, I like to call, I mean, back in the days, my, my description was I'm a West African foodie with um, international taste buds <laughs> because everything that I eat, I love. And yeah. then I started being curious, you know, I started eating Korean food and, um, you know, kimchi and Vietnamese food and just being exposed to that. So it's funny because it wasn't, even though my, my childhood was um, the, the food that I experienced in my childhood was, it was amazing, but it wasn't that, that, you know, that did it for me. It was traveling, being exposed to different cultures. If you want all at once, that really, um, sparked my curiosity about what's out there, yeah. what is there to, you know, basically what is, what is, what is, what did, what, um, I didn't experience yet and how can I, you know, test it all. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, I, and it's actually when you say that, it reminds me also, actually, that's a good point of like my first college. So I also went to 
um, the U.S. for college too, and was my first um, true international exposure, right? So my roommate was Korean, and my okay. best friends were from from Turkey, Japan, mm. Kuwait, and India. Yeah. And, oh wow. Okay. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> we had a, that core group of like international um, student friends, and you're right. Like it's food. It's through food mm-hmm. in a lot of ways that we connected. Right. Exactly. I didn't know. I wasn't as aware of. I don't know what the right way, but it was. It was a definitely. I wouldn't say my sort of interest in in the African food space started there, but that was my sort of first exposure to mm-hmm. national foods, and then also my first. Um, experience trying to explain. I'd never in my life tried had to explain what like my food was, you know, and it was the first oh, yeah. time I had to think <laughs> about what is my like what is my food and what are the different components like, you know, I I just never thought about it. And so it was mm-hmm. an interesting intellectual exercise in some ways. Oh yeah, um, definitely. Definitely and, and just to add to add to that is that, you know, sometimes we'll have all this um those cooking so those cookout where everybody yeah. has to bring something the potluck and I was always oh, yeah. exactly thank you that's the word I was looking for and I was like mom what am I going to cook what am I going to bring because then you realize that those people that never knew where Cote d'Ivoire was never maybe meet, met a people I mean a person from your country mm-hmm. they're going to taste that one dish and automatically believe that you know, if it's if it's good or bad, right. that's what you eat in your country. So I was oh. like, okay, I have to I have to do this right, mommy. What am I going to cook? So it was always interesting because then you will go back to what you right. used to like and try to make it as you know as close as possible that's to the you know faithful as possible to the that. recipe. Yeah, yeah, representing yeah so the whole country with that one. Exactly, the whole country just on your small shoulders, just because you have to bring something to the potluck. <laughs> so yeah that was that was also that's, funny yeah, and interesting yeah that's interesting yeah. and then what what was the the impetus then for starting the food blog so you know you've had this international experience i guess you're mm-hmm. back in cote d'ivoire i suppose when you start the blog like what made you think okay i'm gonna blog and then also specifically blog about food african food yeah, food, like yeah exactly food. so so I come back in Cote d'Ivoire in 2009, if I, my memory serves me right. And then, you know, anytime I was going out with um, my boyfriend, who was like, okay, where were we going to eat? Um, so it, it was really a word of mouth type of thing. If, if I was in an area, I will call a friend and say, hey, I'm in this area of Abidjan. Where should I go? Okay. And then she said, oh, I heard of this restaurant, so and so and so and, you know, and whatnot. And then one day I had, so the, the idea, I want to say the idea was already in my, in my mind because I believe, I mean, at that time, there was, there was no platform where you can just go online, Google, and just search for, you know, restaurants, lounges, anything that had, you know, to do with food. Right. So, I mean, locally speaking. And so, um, you know, the idea was a back of my mind, but I was like, eh, you know, those type of thing you think about it and then you move on with your life. <laughs> yeah. And then I had one um, on a contest on Facebook, a dinner for two at a seafood place. And so, you know, you do the usual research, you know, you're going to eat seafood because, you know, it's a seafood place. But I was curious. I didn't know how the restaurant looked like. I didn't know where the restaurant was. Um, back then, Facebook pages were just about, I think the they had started, but a few years ago, or not even. I can't remember. Yeah, but Facebook like pages Facebook were not. Pages are now more. Maybe there were more groups than pages to begin with. I don't remember. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, they were not really that much in use. Instagram was still, you know, right, still, yeah. um, like something like unknown to a lot of people mm. so it was really hard to find information so as soon as we get there I was with my boyfriend and I'm like hey what if I start a blog and he was like yeah do it I was like eh, okay it's, <laughs> it's, easy. it's easier to say it but you know I, I I knew what a blog was but you know I didn't know where to start how to start what to talk about and and basically the idea was I want to create a platform because from that problem came a solution. Right, um, yeah. I want to create a platform made by an Ivorian for Ivorians look, 
looking for places to eat, information, or just even, you know, how to find a restaurant. Was the staff friendly? Was, you know, the ambience or the atmosphere nice? Was the food good? So it really started just in the parking lot of that restaurant. I will never forget it. It was like, <laughs> hey, I will start a blog. So it was really just like that. And of course, he helped and pushed me to do it because, of course, I was never going to do it on my own. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it just started back then, 2012. Um, I had the idea, I believe, in February. Um, the dinner happened in February. I launched the blog in April. Okay. And um, yeah, that was it. And when I looked online, I didn't even, like I said, I didn't even know a lot of blogs back then, but I realized that it was the first blog, um, the first food blog. of Having Ivorian of, Cote d'Ivoire, yeah. Exactly. So I was like, wow. So I don't think I even realized what I had created yeah. until people <laughs> started writing and saying, if you stop doing this, we're going to get mad at you. And I was like, okay, <laughs> this is serious. <laughs> so that was really interesting. And yeah, it's been seven years Wow. Yeah, seven years ever that's since. A, that's a long, so, that's a long that's some dedication and commitment. <laughs> I know. And tr- I mean, to be honest, I haven't been that consistent. I guess we'll talk about it later, but I haven't been that consistent with it. But it's been an amazing, amazing, amazing journey. I mean, okay. I really can't stress that enough. All right. Um, I think we will take a quick break here. And then when we come back... Uh, for those listening that don't know about Ivorian food, I want us to sort of dial back, take a step back and talk about what Ivorian food is. So mm-hmm. um, the different kinds of foods you have from the different regions, just educate people a little bit about that. Then we'll talk about food tourism. We'll talk a little bit about the different components of the blog and how you use it. I know you also host an Abidjan restaurant week. We'll talk about that mm-hmm. and then wrap up with our rapid fire questions. So okay, cool. a short break here. You're listening to Item 3 an African food podcast. We'll be right back. All right. So we are now going to talk about Ivorian food. Um, my experience with Ivorian food is limited to a chicken and a local <laughs> <laughs> and play. And it's like there's so many in Accra. I don't know. There's been just an explosion of a chicken spots like that now like we have our local chop bars but now i feel like there's a lot of people i don't know if it's an indication of people's interest growing interest in food from other parts of west africa um but i check your spots are just like popping up all over the place and i don't know if it's also because the ingredients are pretty similar to other stuff we do so it's easy to take it in and and Mm -hmm. But uh, for mm-hmm. those that are listening that don't know, have no clue what I'm saying when I say a chicken, <laughs> can we explain to them what that is? And then also share a little bit about other Ivorian foods that I may not know about. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm really not surprised that your experience with Ivorian food is limited to a chicken yeah. and a local. And that's one thing I'm trying to fight with this new product coming up next year. Um, but, you know, I'll tell you about it next year. So, um <laughs> Basically, um, yeah, it's. I mean, AJK was. We eat a lot of. We eat a lot of it here. And basically, what it is, it's. Um, you know, it's made out of cassava. Mm-hmm. So, which is grounded. It's grated. It's grounded and into um, what we can say couscous-like grains. Yeah. Um, a lot of people that I've met sometimes compare it to gari. But it's, yes, it's, 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 it's sim- similar, but not... Si- yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I don't think so. But oh well. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so, like, like you know. a wet, it's like a wet Gary. So Gary, um, for those that don't know, it's also oh, yeah, grated, grated cassava. Um, mm-hmm. that is, but it's a dry, so it's, it's um, I feel like it's, I mean, it's, it's fried. I guess, and it's dry. It's drier, and so you use it in, in different forms. But I check it as I check it in its own. Um, <laughs> yeah, I check it is special on its own. Yeah, it's special <laughs> in its own. Although I will say, I went to um, I don't mean to interrupt you, sorry, but I went to a pop up uh, dinner like a couple of weeks ago that was hosted by someone with Liberian roots, and she had she made like so on the menu was they had a cheke and, and uh-huh. tilapia, and I was so excited because I thought it was going to be similar to um, 
Ivorian acheke, but it was different. It was more, really, yeah. They they prepared the acheke like um, it was more of a dumpling, like a fufu. Mm. It was interesting. Yeah, I, I if I, I I'll see if I have a picture and I'll I'll say, be curious oh, to yeah. see that, my friend. <laughs> it, it was called a check, and I was like, oh, this doesn't, this is different. But I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if librarians have a different. I check the mm. situation, but anyway, so there's a yeah. check which we is different. It's just cassava is the, is the, is the long story short. <laughs> exactly, it's made out of cassava, and we basically eat that. It's one of the most classic thing. If anybody was to come, it's you know it's available you know on the streets. It's available in restaurants, and it's ba- you can basically eat it with um um how do you call it? barbecued or fried fish or chicken. And that's really like a, I want to say a classic thing that you eat um, because we have a lot of maquis here. You're still there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. So we have a lot of maquis which are like out, out, outdoors, informal restaurants all over the town, all over the country. So, like street, so you know, street essentially. I, exactly. So yeah. that's one of the quickest things to make. However, we do have a lot of stew as well. Well, aloko before jumping to stews and stuff. <laughs> um, aloko is fried plantains, banana. So, of course, a plantain is eaten all over from Jamaica yeah. to Ghana right next door. Um, and I, I think it's, for me, the difference um, lies in how you cut it and how, you know, frying is, is universal. But how, you know, it can be cut in different, different, in different regions of the world. But, um, lanterns is plantain is bay. <laughs> That's all I can well, say. For you guys, for uh, it's, it's a local, uh, it's a local specific recipe. Because in Ghana, one of the things mm-hmm. that, like a true foodie, Ga- Ghanaian foodie, will like cringe at is when people see fried plantain and it's called kili wili. Because kili wili, I don't know if you've heard of kili wili. It's different yeah, from I did, regular yeah. fried fried plantain, right? And uh-huh. so it's, it's a local. So kili wili is um, essentially fried plantain it's a softer plantain it's fried with um a lot of spices ginger peppers mm. um and so on and so forth and that is the specific recipe for it and it's called kiri really and then there's just your regular fried plantain that you can fry and eat with beans or whatever um mm. so it's, it's a local a specific is is it just fried plantain or is it yeah a certain way or treated a certain way for it to be called a local no, aloko like from from what you just said, aloko is just fried plantain, okay. you know, plain and basic, just seasoned with a little, a little bit of salt. That's okay. it. Then I think something similar to kele, kele, kele wele. You said, yeah. yep. It's uh, we call here klaklo. So oh, it's yeah. basic. We do. We have kaklo also. Okay, so I don't know if it, but you know, from the description you just mentioned, the way that the, the fact that it's um, it's seasoned, it's mashed up, and you can yeah. put all type of seasoning in there, and yeah, um, that's also so 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 good. Yeah, and I, <laughs> and I wonder if it's um a translation of because kaklo, you uh, at least I I mostly identify it with the the Ewe tribe, which is where I'm from, mm, and we are mostly okay. like my family is also partly Togolese, so I think we get okay. our influence from that, and part some of my exactly. family. Okay. lives in, in Abidjan so mm, I, I don't mm, know if it's mm. the same sort of thread that goes uh, um, you know across the French speaking <laughs> uh, yeah West uh, African and interestingly enough you see what I mean we're just talking about it we just realized that we have similarities in our right. food and that's the beauty of African food I mean African food or West African food yeah um, you know it's just it's just the same because our people grew up together yeah, you know, it's and before it basically was all divided up in into different. Thank you. <laughs> so we're not going to go into politics yeah, and go now, but go <laughs> we, you know, you know where I'm headed. So yeah. the old group. I mean, we have you know the Akan people in Ghana right. or the same Akan people here in Cote d'Ivoire. It's just that you know we have borders, but the food is the same, and of course. Um, let's say our French influence may have played a little part into it, right. whereas you know the British in Ghana and you know and stuff like that. So it's basically the same food. It's just called differently. It may look differently or taste differently, but the the, the foundation or the product used or you know basically the same. Pretty much the same, yeah. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much, pretty much. So um, 
just mention a few other things. We do have uh, palm oil, palm oil nut sauce, um, yep. which is a very, very, very rich. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure you have that in other countries yeah. as well. Uh, we usually eat that with um, plantain, uh, what do we call futu. So we have hmm. futu and we have fufu. So it's, what's yeah, that? I don't think I know what that is. Um, futu is thick and it's basically boiled plantain, which is pounded. Um, oh, interesting. So, yeah. It's pounded either by itself, the plantains, or with yam. And um, you have different varieties of it. Whereas fufu is still boiled plantain, mm-hmm. but it's mashed. Oh. So it's it's different. And yeah, I know... I don't think I've tried that before. Yeah, That's I know true. in Ghana, it's, it's kind of the other way around or something. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't... Yeah. Like I said, it's, it's, the foundation is the same. The but foundation, we, exactly. We, yeah, so we eat the futu with the palm or your nut sauce, which is also good. We also have a dish called kejenu, which is basically like, um, it's, a, it's a spice meal. It could be, it's basically tomato based, okay. um, but with a lot of vegetables. And basically you put all the vegetables in together, you know, water, tomato, everything that you put, want to put in as vegetable. You can cook it with, you know, either um, chicken or... Um, you know, bas- it's basically chicken. Some people can cook it with rabbit. Sorry for people that are animal, <laughs> animal friendly. It's not me cooking it. Don't hate me. But you know, the 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 meat can vary from one culture to yeah, the other. Uh, but it's it's really it's slow cooked, and um, it, you know, it was it's from the the tradition. It's cool of one of the, cooked in one of those. African rounded dish. I don't, I don't know how to describe um, it. Yeah, but you know no, the I one. I think I can picture it. I can picture it, but I don't yeah. know. Yeah, sorry guys, <laughs> if you can't. <laughs> but and it's basically covered with a banana leaf. Yeah. So yeah, it's yeah, really yeah. just the the fact that it's steaming and it's slow cooked. We need and to it's find just, a picture, a video of that. Too, I know, so I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, people so I mean. That. I can talk about Aberdeen food for days, but yeah. I know we have to cut it short. <laughs> um, but um, I do talk about it on my blog, actually, even though it's not complete yet. So I have a part of it. It's called Taste of Cote d'Ivoire. So oh, if people are interested, specifically. yeah, yeah, because I get asked that question all <laughs> the time, I especially living in all this country. Right. Why do you eat in Cote d'Ivoire? Like, for example, you will know that in Ghana, you know, there's a jollof war with Nigeria or, you know, um, yeah. you know, in different countries you can hear, like, you know, you know from the international exposure that in Ethiopia, you know, there's injera and there's all this, you know, the, the, the food. But okay. when it comes to West Africa, Senegal, Senegal you, can, you can say, yeah, okay, there's Chepujen or, you know, there's Yasa. But when it comes to Cote d'Ivoire, it's kind of difficult so I get asked that questions all the time. You're listening to Item 13, an African food podcast. We'll be right back. I, and I, I'm hoping, like, I shouldn't put that out there as a goal. Like, we're talking offline about how we all have these grand goals and fall short of them. Like, I really mm-hmm. hope that by the time I'm done with the, this podcast, that I've interviewed mm-hmm. someone from at least one of each country. So it's like, get a sense yeah. of food from from all over. Uh, yeah, I mean, that would be amazing. This. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because even in my country alone, I haven't tasted everything. Right. So can you imagine on the continent? Right, it's just, there's, there's it's insane. There's people that are doing, ex- like, even just in Ghana, there's, there's uh, food bloggers and, and, um, food entrepreneurs who are you know introducing me to food from other parts of the country that i didn't even know existed so exactly um, exactly yeah, so that's that's all good um yeah. so i want to tie that to the work that you do with abidjan restaurant week so mm-hmm. um again sort of what you've been you've been doing the blog for some time and then yeah you sort of decided that you wanted to put on this restaurant week Mm-hmm. What was sort of the push to do that and what's the experience? How is it set up and what's it, what, what has been the experience of putting that okay. together? Um, I, I like to say I'm a very faithful person and I like to say that uh, Abidjan Restaurant Flag was a God sent idea. I, I really won't know how to explain it better because I literally just woke up one day with the idea in mind and I was oh, like, wow, okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, 
Well, it, 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 it's crazy. So I, I know I've been, I mean, since 2012, I've been doing the blog. And in 2014, I really started to ask the question that I knew there was something bigger than the blog, um, but I, I just didn't know how or you know what ways that could lead me to something bigger. So I kept asking myself that, you know, what can I do that's bigger than just me eating, taking pictures? Even though the way I say it, it sounds simple, but, but it you is, know, it is, yeah, it's, it's a work it's, of educating and, um, yeah, you know, showcasing mm-hmm. what's, what's in my brain scene, which like you just said, it's, it's yeah. not that well known. So it's not that well known, but yeah. for, for me, because I'm kind of hard on myself and I always wanted to do something. I, I think I really wanted to do something bigger than just myself. If okay. you know what I mean? Yeah. Cause for me, the blog is personal. You know, I can go, I can choose the restaurants where I go to. I can choose whether to talk about it or not. And basically the food that you choose is the food that you're going to picture and stuff. So it's, <sighs> it still reflects your own experience and right. your personality. Whereas I wanted to do something bigger for my community, for my country and to showcase what we had, you know, out there. So that idea came about September, um, 2014, like I said, in the middle of the night, I'm not going to go deeper into that. That's, that's another story for another day. Okay. And I started doing research right away because I was like, okay, I'm doing restaurant. Like, I've, I had heard of a restaurant thing before because of course it's an American concept, but you know, it was still kind of unknown to me. So the following day at work, I ain't going to lie. I didn't work that day. <laughs> I was Googling like a mad woman. Just restaurant. And as soon as you typed in restaurant week, you know, you just popped up everything from, um, you know, Singapore restaurant week right. to New York restaurant. It yeah. was just insane. The, I was overwhelmed with information. Of course, very excited. Um, then again, I did nothing happen apart from the research in 2014, 2015, nothing happened. And 2016, and when I say nothing happened, it, it has to, it has unfortunately a lot to do with the fact that, um, I want to say I suffer with imposter syndrome for a while. I'm still suffering yeah. from it, I, I, but you I know, get that. You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You, you you think you're not good enough. You think, who am yeah. I to want to do something <laughs> like that? You think, I don't have the resources. I don't have the money. I mean, you give yourself all kind of excuses not to not jump, to, and, you exactly, know. Exactly. Yeah. So 2016 then, that's when I realized, I guess, me, it's been two years. You got to do something with yourself. Right. And if you don't, I, I, I just a quick pair, um, quick thing i've been talking with a friend about it and he was like you know what when god gives you an idea if you don't execute it it's going to give it to someone else and i was like "Hmm, no (laughs) i don't want that to happen you know i want to make him proud i want to do it and yeah yeah. so you know i started to think about it talk about you know talk to it about you know about sorry with some friends and you know guys please help me you know you in marketing you can help me you into graphic design you can help me you into website building you can help me and it really just started like that. At the time, I had applied to the um, Mandela Washington Fellowship, mm-hmm. and um, thank God, I, you know, I got I got through it. So I, I want to say, it kind of boost my confidence a little oh, bit. That's right. So you 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 got onto you. Um, so can you tell people very quickly what that is for those that don't know? Yeah, I, I think I've interviewed a couple of people on the on the podcast who been Mandela Washington. Fellowship. Yeah, Jay that. from Ghana. Yeah, I think Jay uh, was also. 2017. So yeah, it's basically quickly. It's um a program that was um, led and designed by ex the ex I mean the previous American president Barack Obama, and it gives um, African young African leaders um, the chance to do a six weeks intensive. Um, program in the U.S. There are three tracks into it. So they basically can go into business and entrepreneurship, public management, or uh, civic leadership. And, you know, you are exposed to different, you know, entre- for my, in my case, it was entrepreneurship. So okay. different entrepreneurs talking about the successes and failures. You go to school. It's basically a back-in-the-school program. Some can refer it as a mini MBA. Okay. Um, so it's it's really trained for you to either launch a business if you haven't done already, or you know grow a project, or just basically have an impact in your community. Right. And um, you just have to. That's how you select it. You just show that if they do invest in yourself, 
it's not just for yourself. It's basically for the greater good and it's for your country, it's for the continent, it's to tie in, you know, African countries with the U.S. and make, you know, greater connections and stuff like that. And I remember from not just Jay's experience, but other people that I know that have participated, it's also a great way to connect with other Africans Africans from around the continent, right? Oh, yes. Unbelievable. Yeah, from Kenya, from other parts of the continent that you otherwise wouldn't have. That may also be doing something in your, your space, right? And it's funny, we used to say that we went to um, we went to America to meet Africa. <laughs> no, because literally my roommate was, one of my roommates was from Djibouti, quickly. Um, another one was from Central African Republic wow. and another one from Nigeria. Of course, I've met Nigerians before, <laughs> but just, Nigerians are everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> but just, you know, having that melting pot in the apartment alone, it was just yeah. great, you know, from the, again, from the food, from the culture, from right. the night talks from everything it yeah. was it was it's, it yeah. was an amazing what, what program great, yeah and i hope i i think it's, it's still on um still yeah it's still on and yeah. actually yeah yeah and actually the um it's the application for next year is ongoing now so yeah. if everybody everybody's interested you can either google it and ask me questions i'd be more than glad to help you yeah um so yeah coming back from it just give me that boost i made it that confidence boost, sorry. Mm-hmm. And I just went for it. I just started, you know, approaching one restaurant um, at a time, you know, and then I will just pitch the idea to them. And just quickly, for those of you who don't know Restaurant Week, um, it's um, the goal of the the event, which was um, born in New York in 1992 by the founder of Zagat, um, the guide, uh, was to promote the restaurant's during a slow period for them. So uh, I believe for in New York, for example, it's January when it's freaking cold outside <laughs> and nobody wants to go out. Go out and, yeah. you know, the business is slow. So they will have this um, special menu at, at discounted price. Oh, so that will drive, that. yeah, it will drive volume. And, and basically what you, when you partner with restaurants, you really want them to showcase their, uh, either signature dishes or creativity and have more people coming in. So for me here, of course, you can't just copy and paste the concept. You have to adapt it to the market. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, and for me, it was really, you know how a lot of people will say that or um, restaurants that do propose serve gastronomic food are posh or for certain clientele. And, you know, the everyday Ivorian cannot go to those restaurants. Well, it may be true in some cases, but sometimes it's just a matter of misconception. And so it was really, for me, the idea that everybody can go to the restaurant. If you do, you know, if there's a a good deal on the menu, you can go and experience um, uh, uh, just on top of my head, like a fine Italian dish or find Korean dish or find Japanese dish. I mean, we, we, the, the, the food scene in Cote d'Ivoire is so diverse. That's also one of the things that pushed me to do it. Because I was like, I mean, we have everything from Brazilian to Japanese to French, Italian, Vietnamese, Ethiopian. We have all those restaurants here. And they, I, I knew I had to do something to showcase that to not only us living here, but of course, people out there. Um, you know, so yeah, that's basically how this came about. First edition was in 2017. Um, great turnout, more than 600 people participated. Wow. And um, I had nine restaurants partners. Then 2018, I was in the UK. Um, and then when I came back this year, I really wanted to do it. Um, so I did the second edition in July. And um, yeah, it was, it was a good turnout. It wasn't as great as the first one. Lots and lots of lessons learned yeah. <laughs> from what this experience. Think, um, what, what, what's, what do you think was the difference between the first time and this time around? Um, I, I mean, from personally, I think the biggest for me was the choice of restaurants. Okay. Um, because there's one thing you do lead. Basically, you choose the restaurants uh, who are decided to partner with you on the event. And they propose, you give, you know, you, you give them a guideline, but they propose the menu. They propose a menu and they propose a price. In, the, in all over the world, pretty much, it's a set price. 
So let's say if all the restaurants are doing lunch at 20 bucks, all the restaurants would do also dinner at 35 or 40. Yeah. Um, I couldn't apply that here. So that's the trick because, you know, you have a restaurant that it's not really eye hand or, you know, posh or whatever, yeah. but the, the, the diversity that they will propose in their food will be great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, whereas you have a really yeah. fine establishment. So you can't really ask them to be put on the same right. price. Yeah. So that's, that's something I'm trying to go about because that's, that's a disadvantage in the concept itself. Uh, and also the choice of restaurants. I, I believe I, I could have made better choices. Um, but yeah, that's those are lesson learned <laughs> for next well, that's, year. Yeah, that's interesting. And I wonder if um, one of the, th- I don't know that that's, that. I don't think that that's as much of a barrier, um, at least I could say in like um, Accra, for, I can say specifically for Accra, or I want to say on the continent in general about Accra in terms of real estate, prices Mm. which is what like if you're in the uk (coughs) excuse me or in the u.s in cities like new york where real estate gets expensive you'll find that specifically for african food you will not find a lot of them in um uh what's the what's the right way to put it? like you you find a lot of them in smaller like almost just takeaway situations where you're not you're not likely to have the opportunity to actually sit and enjoy a full meal because mm-hmm. we are constrained by resources in terms of finding bigger spaces, mm-hmm. um, paying for you know staff to actually have a full dining experience. Exactly. Um, yeah. And I wonder if you, I don't know that that's a similar situation in terms of like local food when you're thinking about the spectrum of restaurants to include in, in the restaurant week. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but it sounds like that was one of the the concerns in terms of different price levels and different. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So yeah, like I said, lesson learned. Yeah. Situation. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um. So we'll be wrapping up here. So what's the next for you? You've done two Africa Western Weeks. You've done Yali, which sort of given you sort of a broader business perspective connected with other exactly. Africans. Um, mm-hmm. that's next for Afrofoodie? Um, well, at the beginning of the year, I just, I had rebranded my website. Um, oh, that's right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. From before it was, it was called the Journal d'une Foodie, which is French, of course. And it can be translated to a foodie's diary because it was basically, you know, my diary of food experiences yeah. and um from traveling in you know the countries i mentioned before it was interesting for me to see that people from the diaspora but also people um from english speaking countries were interested in reading about it um you know with the boost of tourism especially in african countries you find a lot of people are more and more interested in visiting your country but if they only find information in french it's not going to do it so I tried to build a bilingual platform. I said right. try because it's really hard. <laughs> and even though are you, I'm are perfect. You, are you translating like yourself? Are you going using Yes. Oh, yes, wow. dear. Okay. Yes, I am. But um, like I said, I've been putting a lot of things in standby because other projects are happening. So um, I did rebrand the website to a bilingual platform, but I haven't been consistent with it. But definitely that's something that I have to work on in the near future. Um, when I was in the UK, it was also thanks to my blog that it was um, to do um, a master in international tourism because I my my big passion as of now is, is focusing on food tourism oh, and like I said, right. promoting my you know promoting my food to the, from a culinary standpoint um, to the rest of the world. So I do have a big project coming up. It's actually a business, um, oh. so I'm gonna dip my toes in hey you learned at homo <laughs> shout out to my people yeah i'm going to dip my, my toes in, in entrepreneurship um it's been it's been a long time coming i've been afraid again yeah um to do it but um i believe next year is the year by god's oh, grace awesome. so business coming up 
promoting um, Ivorian food. I'm not going to say much more. Okay. Crossing fingers. <laughs> we'll, and, they will be watching the space, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and just uh, keeping on promoting. So I've been the way, you know, some here and there partnership with brands and restaurants, mm-hmm. um, you know, to promote their communication and just working into that you know, content creation space. Um, again, not on a consistent basis because, you know, I found myself wanting to do all of it at the same time. Right. And I just realized that it's it's just not happening. So um, as of now, I'm really taking it slow, doing one thing at a time, and especially when you are alone. Um, I, I used to say, coming back to my favorite couple in the UK, you and Yolanda, <laughs> that they're so lucky to have each other because, yeah. you know, you can talk among yourself and brainstorm. I mean, of course, I have a support system, but at the end of the day, you are you are still alone. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know so, what you mean. And I, <laughs> yeah. it's, I've, I've actually struggled with, like I've gone back and forth about it in that uh-huh. there have been, t- I think it's a double-edged Challenging sword, times. right? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's a double-edged sword. One in that, like, if you have a clear vision and direction for where you want to go, Mm-hmm. You don't need to necessarily check in with anyone and sort of have them re... Because sometimes you have a very strong conviction, right? And so if you exactly. have a team or something, that could sort of move that around. But on the other mm-hmm. hand, it's nice to be able to not have to be the only person that's thinking about this. Like, exactly. All the time. Yeah. Like, you wake up yeah. at night and just, think, oh uh... my God, like, did I do <laughs> Even yeah. just the brainstorming process, yeah, you know, sharing right. ideas, you know, talking about it. Um, yeah. So basically, yeah, lots of lots of product coming up, but definitely building a business around my passion. That's um, nice. That was the goal of doing a, a you know, master's degree in tourism. And I believe, all, you know, it, all, it will all fit into yeah, uh, all the pieces the will come in more, together. More, I think because there's a lot more focus on the continent as a tourist destination. Obviously, yeah, this this uh, this holiday season, most of it is focused on, on Ghana. But I think that there will be. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I I'm think jealous. There, be, yeah. ah, there should I, come I its next know, door. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we can we can do something. Done. I mean, here. it's great, but uh, I feel like. I don't know if a crack can take all that, but we'll see. And maybe the yeah. sort of spillover effect might be that yes, people then decide, okay, I've done a craft a couple of times. Mm-hmm. Like, what, mm-hmm. what what else is there to offer in the region? Since yeah, I mean, a so great opportunity, and there's there's bound to be spillover, you know, effect. Oh yeah, really and especially when it comes to the food, because right. of course that's right. that's, that's for me one of the best things to experience a culture. Right. You know, trying the local food, you know, connecting with the local people. But yeah, food, food definitely is, is, is huge. It's huge. So yeah, crossing fingers. Stuff. <laughs> Good. Okay. So before we do the rapid fire questions, we you should let people know where they can find you online, social media, your website. Mm-hmm. So uh, basically website, well, blog website, it's called Afrofoodie. So afrofoodie.net. Okay. Um, and then once you click on that, you have the English version. It's you know the little flag is right there, so you can translate. I I and should look, I should look into. I don't know how I translate my podcast into French. So that <laughs> oh yeah, I can I can help you one day. I'm not saying tomorrow, but you know we can we can discuss that definitely. Um, and then um, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook is Afro Foodie. Okay. Um, the the only difference is Twitter is Afro Afro and it's called Foodie. Okay. But yeah, if you just Google Afro foodies, something should come up and then yeah, that sure. can lead you to me. Show notes. So if you're listening, if uh-huh. you tap the cover art, it will show the show notes and then you can see the links to click to yes. the website and social media and all that good stuff. So Yeah. And if anybody's interested, like I said, about the different programs I've been on, whether it's been, whether it's um Yali, Chevening. I'm also now in another program called We Are. It's called AWEC. It's um, African Women Entrepreneurship Cooperative. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, it's also <laughs> promoting, and all, it's also thanks to the blog. So, hey, uh, it's also promoting women businesses um, in Africa. Oh, that's really um, neat. I'm more than happy to discuss those opportunities with anyone because, I mean, they're a blessing in a way, but not just for me. They're a blessing for me to help other people as well. Yeah. So, I'm definitely interested in that just well, somewhere on social media. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So let's do our rapid fire questions. 
Okay. All you right. Know, Ready? They, I, I tried to switch that I, up, but I, I know there's, <laughs> there's a trick one. I'm, I'm going to take a joke on it. I hope you didn't, you didn't put that again. Yeah. So, well, see, I don't know. What I, I don't remember what I asked you the last time. So we'll, Okay. We'll go ahead. Shoot. Fire day. away. I'm ready. <laughs> um, we talk, uh, okay. Coffee or tea? Tea. Um, sweet or salty? Sweet. Morning person or night person? Morning person. What? Oh, this is good. What gets you out of bed in the morning? Food. <laughs> like I'm just, literally when I'm hungry, I'm just like, okay, it's time to get up. <laughs> I'm not lying. It's the same truth. It's just like this <laughs> like, Okay. Um, and then the last question: um, If you could live on one dish for the rest of your life, what would that be? Um, that would be for you. It's a, it's, hmm, I know I had to describe it last time, but it's basically a dish I grew up with from Guinea because mm-hmm. my mom's side, you know, the family is from Guinea and we also find it in the north of Cote d'Ivoire and you can eat it with a tomato based stew or peanut, but, um, peanut butter stew. It's um, small grains. Um, oh, that's yeah. Antonio. Yeah. So yeah, I, 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 all the rage these days, it's supposed to be a, it's a superfood. Thank um, you. Yeah, chef and all of that good stuff. Yeah, if you know Chef Pure Tiam, who is yes. Senegalese, he's he's been promoting for you a yes. lot. And I'm I just, just, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I I just love it. I don't know. I I keep asking my mom if you know she they, they cut my umbilical cord with it when I was <laughs> born. I don't know, but I can just leave off of that. It's really light, really good. Um, so yeah, for you, anytime, yeah, any day. And it's the uh, Chef Pierre's brand is called Julele. Exactly. Yes. Um, and we've used that in events in the past. We actually, um, I'm going to New York this weekend to co-host an event, um, on Monday. Uh, and is it related to food? It's actually related <laughs> to, we're trying to, um, working with Impact Hub, New York metro area, who is trying to build an Africa innovation ecosystem. And one of the aspects of that is food. And so mm. we've, invited, we've invited Yulele as part of the discussion on the food. Oh, that, and they'll be bringing samples of Sonia. So okay, please invited. share it. And <laughs> share with me afterwards. I'll love to hear about it. I mean, yeah, hey. I'll definitely let you guys know all about how that goes. Um, okay. Cool. Okay. Um that was it. So I, I passed think. the I passed the rap I passed the rapid fire question. <laughs> yes, you you did. didn't ask me about Nigerian jollof no, or Ghanaian jollof. I'm trying so to stay good. away from, from <laughs> that controversy now. Yeah, I don't want to lose any friends. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank well, you, thank great. you, thank you. Thank you for making the time. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Item 13, an African food podcast. If you like the show, please subscribe, rate, and review us on your favorite podcast app. To keep up to date, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Item13Podcast. Thank you. Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like, Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then, like, how, how that all came to be and realize, like, wow, like, this piece of legislation, all this money, like, it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to The Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts.